This meeting is being recorded. There you go. So um, I know that um, our guest speaker has a lot of great information to share with us. So we'll we'll just let other people in as they join us. But um, first of all, thank you um, to those who are our guests tonight, Holly, Vicki, and our guest speaker, um, Gay Romack. Thanks for uh, joining us this evening. This is a, a group um, that evolved from our sacred ground course that we offer through the Episcopal Church that helps raise awareness about, um, uh, in particular, racism, but also uh, injustices uh, in our country. And so we formed Sacred Journey to continue the learning process and we take up topics. Well, like this month, we're going to uh, hear about human trafficking, transgender youth, and uh, death penalty is coming up and restorative justice is also coming um, up this month because in our diocese, this is uh, September is Prison Awareness Month. So I kind of stacked the deck um, with with uh, incarcerated <laughs> incarceration related uh, topics, we will have a guest speaker for um, the death penalty from Death Penalty Alternatives in Arizona, and a guest speaker for restorative justice, uh, a, a current attorney who is uh, working with the death penalty alternatives as well, but also with a restorative justice a justice organization. So we'll have two more guest speakers this month and anyone is welcome to join the same link that you got for today will work for any of them. It's the same link for all of our sacred journeys. So um, I see that most of you have already put yourselves on mute. Thank you very much for doing that. I am going to introduce our, our uh, guest speaker, um, Gay Romek, you wanna know, wave Gay? <laughs> Hi everyone. Gay uh, was ordained what, 16 years ago now is it or? I think so. Like a century, a century ago. <laughs> and um, she serves as a deacon at St. Peter's Episcopal Church in Litchfield Park, which was the first church that I attended when I moved to Arizona back in 2008. She also leads the uh, worship teams that go into Perryville Women's Prison, and she's been doing that since December 7th of 2012, which was our first day in there. We were so excited. And um, in December uh, 2017, she formed the 501c3 organization called Bridges Reentry, and uh, has uh, that group has purchased a home in Avondale in January of 2019. And in May of 2019, Gay was there to greet the first resident of that uh, facility, and uh, the the. Magdalen House West is based on the models that were um, that was created by Reverend Becca Stevens, another Episcopal priest out in Tennessee, and she has um, uh, the organization is called Thistle Farms. You should Google it. All my T-shirts come from Thistle Farms. Uh, love, love, love that site, uh, and it helps support women who uh, who are in need of support. When the pandemic hit in 2020. The prisons halted all volunteer programs, including the worship services. So Gay, being ever resourceful, came up with a new way to continue offering mentoring and worship to this uh, to the ladies uh, in Perryville by using something called video casting, which I hope she'll talk a little bit more about today. And then, lest you think that she just sat back on her laurels and did nothing else, in 2021, she launched a mentoring ministry to assist women who are being released from prison. And we even have a participant in that mentoring program as one of our, uh, one of the people that has joined us today. Um, in my opinion, Gay is a dynamo when it comes to developing and implementing programs that are designed to help people stay out of prison. Um, she's been named Deacon of the Year by the Association of Episcopal Deacons. I don't remember when that was, like 2015 or something. something. But anyway, yay for her. And uh, she um, was instrumental in helping me discern my calling to the diaconate. So yay again. Um, she is my hero. She is my inspiration. Me too. And, 
I am so, so very pleased that she um, let me strong arm her into being with us this evening to speak with us um, more about her work uh, with the women in Perryville and beyond. So with that, I will shut up and turn it over to Gay. Thank you, Gay. Thank you. Thank you, Deacon Kim. And I, I'm just, I'm so honored to be with all of you this evening. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to be able to spend some time with you and to share with you some of my prison stories and to hopefully inspire you to include the justice involved population in the wide net that we deal with in loving thy neighbor. My journey actually started oh, more than 10 years ago at the dinner table. And my husband and I were eating dinner and the phone rang. And I heard, I heard him um, kind of talking to someone on the phone and, and the person he was talking to was, was very upset and crying. And, and um, he eventually couldn't handle it. And he mouths to me and he says, this is Melinda on the phone. That's his secretary. And he said, you talk to her. So he hands me the phone. And I'm like, what am I supposed to say to her? And so she tells me the story that her baby boy, Josh, is in jail. Now, I knew Josh when he was two. So I kind of lost a few years about what happened to Josh. And so she told me that he was in jail and she was so upset. There was a big mistake. She didn't know what to do. And I said, would you like for me to go see him? And as soon as I said those words, I thought, uh-oh, what am I going to do? I have no idea what I'm going to, how I'm going to go visit someone in prison. I'd never been to a jail before. And as soon as I heard my own voice asking her that, I wanted to pull those words back. But then I heard her say, would you do that? And I said, yeah, I'll do that. So I did that. That's really how it got started. And I pulled into the parking lot of the, of the lower Buckeye County Jail. And I was petrified. I had no idea what I was going to do. None. And I remember locking my car doors before I got out. And I prayed, God, just be with me. Give me the words to say to this young man when I go see him. And I immediately knew when I walked into the visiting room, to the waiting room where people were waiting to see their loved ones, that I was in the underbelly of humanity. And there were fatigued and haggard faces of loved ones waiting to see on camera the one who had betrayed them, lied to them, maybe probably stolen from them, and knowing that they were going to ask for money that they didn't have. And there was a sadness that prevailed in that room. And I knew that that's where I belonged. And I met with Josh every week from December 2009 to December 2010 while he was waiting for a court date. And we did a confirmation class. We did a baptism class together. Many Bible stories exploring the nature of God and the character of God and, and 
the people that God chose to work with. And when we were, when we were getting close to the end, Josh said to me, he says, Deacon Gate, you're pretty good at this. And I took that as a sign. That was my sign that I was supposed to be in prison ministry at Perryville. I thought it would be a piece of cake that they would be so excited to have me, such an important deacon, right? To be in prison ministry at Perryville. Well, I was mistaken. I was up against a bureaucracy that I had no idea how to deal with it. So I did what I know best is to form relationships. So I formed relationships with people in the department, people in the chaplaincy at Perryville. And after two years of trying to get a, a time to go in for worship services, I was finally awarded a slot. And the attitude of the department was then, I don't know if it still is now, Deacon Kim can probably speak to that because she's tried to get into prison ministry as well. But the attitude then was, first of all, what is a woman doing being in charge of a ministry? It's for men. Women can teach education classes, but not run a prison ministry. The second attitude was, how many Episcopalians do you think are in prison anyway? So that's what we dealt with. The first service that we had there, I prayed that someone would show up. God, just send me someone so that I don't look like a fool to these people who finally given me a slot on Saturday morning at nine o'clock. And I have to admit, I was a little perturbed that I got a Saturday morning at nine o'clock slot because I thought who in their right mind is going to want to get up and go to a worship service on Saturday after they've been working all week. And then I found out it was visitation also on Saturday. And I thought, well, no one's coming. Well, God sent two or three and that was enough. I was so grateful. I was so grateful. And it was then that I found out that not very many people in prison had visitors. No one came to see them. And the next couple of weeks after we went on Saturday, the service began to grow and grow and grow. So that before COVID, we were ministering to about 140, 150 women every week. It has been the most rewarding ministry that I've been involved with every, every day. I'm blessed with knowing these women. They inspire me. They give me energy. They, um, they make me laugh. They're very funny. I'll tell you one of my funniest stories. I have a lot of them, but I'll tell you one of them that's really, that was really funny. We were studying the Bible scripture of John the Baptist being beheaded. And before I was preparing for this, I thought, oh, this is not, this is not going to be a good thing to have to talk to these women about John the Baptist being beheaded. So I, you know the story, right? So I don't need to tell you the story that, that, the daughter 
the daughter does a dance and 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 she is told that she can she can have anything that she wants and so she goes to her mother and she says what should i what shall i ask for and the mother says john the baptist's head so she comes out and instead of asking for land or wealth or anything she asks for john the baptist's head that's the story so at Perryville, so I was telling them the story and I was talking to them about really making choices. And so at the end, I always ask them what their, what their takeaway is. And I said, so now what can your takeaway be this evening from this story? And one woman raises her hand and she says, never listen to your mother. So yeah, I get lots, of, I get lots of laughs from from them. They they feed me. So our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, frequently talks about creating a beloved community, and a beloved community is uh, wrapped in God's unconditional and unrelenting and all-inclusive love. And that's what Jesus had in mind, I think, in the scripture passage of loving thy neighbor and so many passages, so many examples. The kingdom of God is loving thy neighbor. And that's what the kingdom of God looks like. And that's what I think we're all all of us are working towards. And after working in prison ministry, where we tried to create a beloved community on the inside, I'm convinced that it is equally important to create beloved communities on the outside. And when you think about 90%, over 90% of the people incarcerated will be released. It is so incredibly important that we have communities on the outside who will help them, who will embrace them and become beloved communities for them on the outside. And I think our churches are a perfect place for that to take place. We need beloved communities in our churches to embrace the incarcerated, to embrace them when they're released and help them to become the people that God has in mind for them. I'm grateful to our National Episcopal Church and to the Arizona Diocese for providing seed monies to support bridges reentry that Deacon Kim mentioned. Um, they have provided seed money in an effort to um, house and educate and empower and employ women from Perryville as they work to change their lives. We get to see transformation all the time. We talk about that in church almost every Sunday. You will hear some form of a message about transformation, changing. And with working with people who have been incarcerated, we get to see that change. We get to see them going from being angry and being resentful to being loving and forgiving. We get to see that. And we get to see them going from their addictions to moving into recovery and from going from alienation from their families and their loved ones to reconciliation, to seeing children, grandchildren, 
that they'd never seen before and to reconciling with their kids and celebrating birthdays and, and benchmark events that they have been deprived of for a great deal of their lives. We've also begun um, a mentoring program on the outside, beyond the gates, where we match a volunteer mentor with a mentee who, from the inside. And the mentor will walk alongside the mentee for a year and provide guidance and help them with encouragement and accountability just to be with them, just to say, hey, I'm here, I'm with you, I am helping you in prayer and support and to be accountable to yourself. And I really want all of our churches to be open to being beloved communities and to wrap every justice involved person they ever come across to wrap them in God's unconditional and unrelenting and all-inclusive love. There are so many things that are involved in dealing with people in re-entry. It begins even with knowing what to call them. Do we call them ex-felons, ex-cons? Do we call them friends? Do we call them justice-involved people? Can't tell you how many countless meetings I've been to where we've had that discussion. And there's always controversy. Believe it or not, there's always controversy. I think I'm settling in on justice involved because it includes so many different categories. But no matter what they're called, we are all called, we are all called to deal with loving thy neighbor, embracing everyone in God's circle, being inclusive, being not being judgmental. The mandate in, in, our, in the Bible of visiting those in prison is so much more than the visitation. It's so much more than that. And we are all called to embrace them and to be beloved communities to them. So I'm hoping that um, for the rest of the time that we have together this evening, that um, you will feel free to ask me any questions or make comments or um, wherever the spirit might take us in this discussion. I'm open for that. Well, Gay, before they um, before they start asking you questions, I wondered if you could um, share some information about the video casting that you're able to to offer now the the brand new ministry that you that you've rolled out this year. Yeah, this is really this was very fun to do. I had again, it was. Um, I know that we say this loosely, like it was a godsend, but it really was. I, I have no other ex way to explain it. I knew that we had to be able to communicate somehow with the women um, during COVID that, that we were prohibited from going in on, to visit. So we couldn't do worship services. And I tried, I, I really tried hard for, oh, throughout 2019 
to every week I would take out bulletins and um, music sheets. I couldn't give them the music, but I could print out the words. And I would, I would deliver those to the chaplain in hopes that somebody on the yard would get it and would carry on in whatever way they could. I mean, I really just had to leave this up to the spirit because I couldn't, I couldn't control it at all. And then one day I just had this thought, well, they all have tablets and they're, they're little tablets, but they all have tablets and they can access certain programs on their tablets. Now they don't have the internet, right? But they do have access to different educational programs. So I thought, well, what if we could take our mentoring program that we had done on the inside and put it on a video cast and deliver it to their tablets? And sounds like a great idea, doesn't it? And so then I thought, I don't know how to do that. I don't even know how to video anything at that time. We were just starting with Zoom. Well, then someone introduced me to a woman who lives in Pebble Creek, which is not far from me. And she had already developed a uh, video cast for her own book, which was about um, leaving a legacy of faith. And so I asked her if she would help me. Now, I didn't say, would you do the whole thing for me? But that's really what she ended up doing because I had no idea what to do. So I had to get, I had to get permission from the department. And you have to understand that their default is always to say no. That's just what they do. You ask them anything, and they say no. And then if you're lucky, they might rethink it and then give you another chance. So I had been working with them long enough that I knew that if you want something, it has to be a pilot. So it has to be a pilot program. It has to be on a very narrow margins because they don't want mistakes, right? They don't want something to fail. So if you started something big and it bombs, they look really bad. So you start something small and you make it work. And so that's what we did. So now we have, we've completed the first book that we did was Joyce Meyer's um, Battlefield of the Mind. And so I distribute the books to the women at Perryville. They can access the, our teaching on videocast. So they can access it on their tablets and they see familiar faces. Like they'll see my face and I will introduce the program. I'll tell them what we're gonna do, guide them along tell them, okay, look for this in chapter, whatever it is, and then work, answer these questions in your workbook. So the first, I think the first one we did, we had 26 people, women sign up for it. And we're, the next one we did was Pathway to Purpose. We had 66 women sign up for it. And then I'm thinking, oh no, how am I gonna get all these books? Because I had, I have to admit, I got a little lazy. You know, if you order, you can't go on Amazon and order just a lot of books unless they're new. If you order used ones, which saves you a lot of money, then they come in like piecemeal and I'm getting, you know, two or three books every day for three weeks. Well, I didn't want to do that. So I just ordered all new books. But then when people kept signing up for it, I thought I can't continue doing this because we don't have that big of a prison ministry budget in our, in our church. And so anyway, so now that's going to prompt me the next time around, I'm going to 
try to get money from other churches to help sponsor the books. <laughs> but but the next book we're doing is Boundaries. That'll book, be book three. And then um, the last one will be the legacy book, be, le Leaving a, a Legacy of Faith. And it has been an incredibly um, rewarding ministry to do. And comments that I've gotten from some of the women, like the one that really touched me the most was a woman who has who has a life sentence, very small chance that she might be released. She's been in for 20 years. And she said, there aren't programs like this available to me. And I so appreciate the, the opportunity to learn. And she said, if I had had if I had had boundaries in high school instead of calculus, I wouldn't be in prison. So that's the mentoring program, the, the mentoring um, and beyond that we're doing on the inside. And I just wanted to reemphasize that you're looking for help with purchasing books for the books. upcoming. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the next go around. Yeah. Yeah. Any idea? Because you don't know how many people are going to sign up, right? Mm -mm. Okay. No, but but we're looking at like um, the the pathway to purpose book, for example, that we just did. It's about sixteen dollars per book, and we'll probably have my guess is the next go around. We'll probably have seventy. I'm thinking we'll probably have seventy. So okay. that, that gives you some idea. Okay. And I wondered, uh, uh, because I, I wanted to hear a little bit more about Magdalene House West. And okay. I remember you telling me a story one time about a lady who was released with her little box of books. <laughs> you remember that story? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, I wonder if you could share that story with us and then tell us a little bit about what you do mm -hmm. at Magdalene House West <laughs> and about the open houses coming up. Okay. Um, when women are released from Perryville, assuming that they don't have families to pick them up, which at least half of them don't, their day starts out with a lot of anxiety. They get up really early in the morning they have to go to a central place and make sure all of their paperwork is in place. And if no one has brought them clothing, then they have to go to this horrible shed that's hot and in disarray. And they have to go through a bunch of old clothing to find something that they can wear so that they don't have to walk out in their orange. And they have to find shoes because most of them haven't purchased their own tennis shoes. So they don't have shoes to walk out in. And then in addition to that, they have a little prison box that's like a bank box. Think of a bank box, the size of a bank box, you know, the, the cardboard box that has the little handles on the side. And that contains all of their possessions. Their books, they're only allowed 10 books. Their books, their letters, their cards, maybe that they've gotten, everything that they take with them goes in that box. So the story, and oh, and then now they get 200, I, it's either 200 or 250. Do you remember, Kim? I think it's, it's 200. 200. I think it's 200. At the time, when we first started, it was $50 that they got um, when they're released. So the story goes that the, it was raining on this one day that this girl was released. And she, she had a lot of books. And so she wanted, she had two prison boxes 
and she put all of her books in the two boxes. And it was raining so hard that by the time she got to the bus station, she got the wrong bus. And then she, she's trying all this time to get to her transition home. And she took the wrong bus. She was running out of time because they only have a certain amount of hours that they have to report to their, to their transition home. If they don't report in that length of time, they, they can get sent back. And so she took one box that was already falling apart and she hid it under a tree, hoping that she could come back and get it after she went to her place where she was supposed to go. And by the time she found the right bus, I think I have the story right, by the time she found the right bus and started getting on the bus and the second box was falling apart, had gotten all wet and she lost all of her books. And when she tells the story, it's, it's like funny, sad, you know, I mean, because she tells it really funny, but it's really very sad. Um, but not atypical of what they have to go through to get back into society. So it was really all that that reentry trauma that um, uh, sparked my interest in helping this population, this re-entry population. And everything that I read, everything that I looked at indicated that housing comes first. And you've read that probably with the homeless population too, is that if they have a safe place, then they can begin to heal. And so that's what we focused on was finding a home where, and I wanted it to be close to the church because I knew that the church would be the sphere of influence and support, not financially, but spiritually, emotionally, in fellowship. These women needed fellowship. So I thought, that we could find a house to rent. And so we applied, I think I, I gave up after about the 15th application that was turned down and thought, there's no way anybody is going to rent to us because of what we're trying to do. And I tried workarounds that didn't work. And so it became, apparent that we needed to purchase a home so one day at church how long do am i am i talking like way too much no you still have about another 10 to 15 minutes okay talk. so one day at church and i i'm you know i'm not going to tell you a lie right this is exactly how it happened and after the worship service you know how some people kind of hang around and, and they don't really come right up to you and talk to you, but you know that they want to say something. And so there was a, a woman and her husband who were kind of hanging around. And I thought, I need to go talk to them. And she had been, she had been um, Googling Thistle Farms, and that Kim mentioned, and Thistle Farms is, is out of Nashville, Tennessee. And she had been Googling them, interested in what they were doing, and had asked Thistle Farms if, they, if there were any um, transition homes in Arizona. And so they gave them my name, and she tracked me down. And she told me that she and her husband wanted to help. And I thought, okay, what exactly, and you know, what exactly does that mean? And she said, I know you're looking for a home. 
and we, and she said, she said, we can't afford to help you with the whole home. I'll never forget that with the whole home, she said, but we have a hundred thousand dollars that we'd like to give to you so, to help you purchase something. So I did what I normally do when I don't know what to do. And that was to cry. And so I started crying because I thought, really, is this really going to happen? And so that's really how it happened. And so from that, I, um, I knew we couldn't get a loan because we didn't have any income to show income. So we, I began looking for a, a private funder who agreed to terms that we could live with for, um, to finance the rest of it. And this, thank God this was before, you know, all the prices just went crazy like they've gone in the last couple of years. So we were able to purchase a, a very nice four bedroom home in Avondale. We can house six women um, and we have a resident manager who lives in, in the property. She has also been incarcerated and actually our resident manager now um, went to our services on Perryville for over 10 years and um, she was released. Uh, no one thought that she would be released. She'd been in for 25 years. Um, so we had our first graduate. We have a two year rent free program for the women. And the, the reason that it's rent free is to help them learn how to save money, to be financially independent, which is a very important you know, many of them had never, ever been in a bank, had a savings account, a checking account. And our first graduate graduated having saved over $15,000. Okay, what else do you want to know? I've had a question in the chat asking, um, how can we donate to support your uh, program ministry? I think it's specific to books, but I guess anything else. Do you want me to put the Bridges Reentry link in that here? Would, that would be great. If you, if you go to the BridgesReentry.org website, there's a place <laughs> for donations. And, you know, it's very, it's, we're a nonprofit. It's very capital intensive because we do, um, like I said, we <clears throat> we provide rent-free housing for the women. So just to give you an idea, if you're incarcerated, it costs about $30,000 a year for you to be incarcerated. And our program for the women is it, it's just a little bit under $15,000 a year. So you can look at it as a tax savings <laughs> if you want to. And would yeah. that uh, Bridges Reentry be um, also the button that they would use to donate for the books for the mentoring program inside? Yes, they can, okay. they can do that as well. It's probably easier. They could either do that or they can make it out to, to St. Peter's and just put on the memo that it goes to the prison ministry to books. Either way. Okay. Well, I am going to, uh, I think, remove this spotlight now. And Thank you. allow uh, people to raise your hand if you have a question, and I will call on you. <clears throat> no one has a question. Okay, Daryl. <laughs> I was waiting for somebody else to go, but I just got a really easy question, uh, Dick and Gay. Is, are you, as the COVID restrictions still on? Are you still not allowed to come back? No, no, we're back in. Um, so we um, actually, we're on all of the yards that are open. We, so we're, um, so that, that's three, four, five yards that, that, we're, um, that we're ministering to. 
and and our attendance is not what it was before covid i and but we're experiencing that same thing at our church at st peter's and i think probably around the diocese as well but we're still we're we're back to about i think about 65 a week with with all the yards and on five yards, that means five times that you're going into the prison each week. And you have a team of how many people? Twelve. Twelve people. And two of them have COVID. <laughs> <laughs> no justice. So if anybody knows anybody who lives in the um what uh let's see western suburbs of the phoenix area that might be interested <laughs> they should contact deacon gay because she's always looking for volunteers um holly yeah. you might know some folks because aren't you up in phoenix area too so i am for what specifically for uh, just for any worship teams ellie ellie hutchinson is one of your team members right yes yeah you know yeah. How, yes. Uh, ellie holly so she can tell yeah. you more about it too yeah. yeah. And I think um, uh, Father Emmanuel had a question. Yes. Um, my question to question. Uh, please, Reverend Gay, did you, I read in the website that there's worship services like five times a week. Is that right? Yes. Uh, from our worship team in the church? Correct. So that's like every day of the week, Monday through Friday? Well, we it, we go to, we have two on Tuesday, one on Wednesday, and two on Saturday. Oh. Okay. My other question, I, about this uh, Bridges re-entry, would that be equivalent to, uh, if I get it wrong, uh, uh, pardon me, I have never really understood this term, halfway house. Would that be something like a halfway house? Yeah, it's it, the terminology for, for the homes is really um, a little ambiguous. Um, a halfway house is more of a um, sort of like a... a a way station, okay? Like you would go and if you if you are homeless, you have no place to go and you're gonna be there temporarily. But the transition home that we have is not considered a halfway house. It is a program. So they, they must commit to being in a two-year program. So we have different um, phases in the program that have to do with, uh, uh, how should I call it? Like if, if you accomplish certain things within a certain period of time, then you have more freedoms. Like your curfew, for example, when you first get there is at nine o'clock at night. And as you stay longer, then the curfew increases. You can't have a car for the first 90 days. And so, so it's, it's not a halfway house in that respect. It's really a transition home with a program. With a program for two years. Correct. But the halfway house is a very temporary place of stay. Correct. Oh, okay. Yeah, usually the halfway house is about six weeks. There are a few, of them, a few of them that will go, uh, you know, three or, or four months or a few, uh, a little bit longer. But most of them are very short, a very short time. So we don't have halfway house facilities for Perryville? We have the transition home that Deacon Gay was talking about. Yeah. Halfway, home, halfway houses aren't really... Um, are, are, there's enough of those out there and, and they aren't really, it's just a quick turnaround. You don't get to build a relationship with the people. Um, DKA, you could probably talk a little bit more about that, but the transition home, 
um, you know, really seeks to help them help them successfully re-enter society, whereas a halfway house is just a temporary holding place until they can get rid of them. Yeah. And uh, you talk about many of them getting out without shoes, clothes, and so on. I'm not sure the society knows about these, particularly the churches. Otherwise, American churches and worshipers are very generous. And yes. they know this. I think this has not been publicized enough. Otherwise, if they did that, people will donate generously, used clothes that don't just size them anymore, shoes and all. People mm -hmm. will flood them to the church and it could be taken to chaplains. Is there any way this could be done? Yes, just takes more people. Just, you know, takes takes more. But absolutely. I mean, we've had we've had clothing drives, we've had shoe drives that was very successful um, for men and women. Um, and and so yes, all of that is very possible. Yeah. Just need just more people to do it. Anybody can take a bag of clothes to any prison facility anywhere near you. Yeah. And and drop it off. The men's facilities are, you know, just about everywhere. The women's facility is in Goodyear, Arizona. So if you need to get women's clothes there, we have to work it out so that I can get them up to uh, up to gay from Tucson. But uh, for men's clothes, you can take them to the Tucson men's prison. Um, men's shoes you can take there as well. You don't need us. You can you can go in and they usually have bins where you can put your bag of donated items right there. They have a bin there. now at Perryville outside. Yeah. That you can just drive your car through and 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 mm -hmm. drop them off. Yeah. But Deacon Kim, I mean, this is an idea, okay, because we're sacred journey and we're here and thinking what we can do. And we have food baskets and we donate every week to some place. Why can't we have one more little basket where we can dump some clothes in? some shoes, we all have it. And then we'll yeah. figure out how to send it because you're talking about going to Perryville or some places we don't even know about. We do know about a basket that's outside our church <laughs> as a comment. Yes, and, and we could do that. I hesitate to get involved in the clothing and the shoe donations simply because I kind of know what happens to them when we donate them and, and they are gone through and the best things are taken by the uh, staff and the officers that, that work there and the rest are just piled on the floor in a dumpy little room and the inmates are given five minutes to go through there and pick out their clothes before they leave. So um, yes, they're, they need clothing, yes, and they need shoes. They don't want it, we don't want them released barefoot. But um, I think that donating to agencies that provide clothing specifically for individuals that are being released is an even better uh, way or supporting organizations um, like Magdalene House with clothing so that these women can um, have proper clothes to wear for job interviews and so on. I think um, I prefer that, but if you would want to donate clothing just directly to the prison, it's, you know, you can Google it. I mean, it's just, just down the road from us. So uh, it's, a, it's a matter of uh, whether somebody wants to host that uh, drive and, and we can take the clothes down there and give them to the chaplain, or if you have some um, yourself. I, I have a friend at our church whose wife died several years ago, and he's asked me to come and help him clean out the closets. And I will be giving all the clothes to Deacon Gay, because I know these are gonna be really nice clothes um, so that she can share them with the women at Magdalene House for their job interviews. But, uh, you know, we can do something, Daryl. Um, it's just, um, you know, having, having a, a drive to, to raise hygiene supplies for, for the women who are being released and so on. Those we know get into their hands. And I'm a little disappointed in the way that the clothing is handled in the prisons. So we have a lending closet at Magdalene House that, um, that any of the mentees that we're dealing with, um, even if they aren't a resident of Magdalene House, they can come 
if they need, if they've been released and they need clothing, they can get it from there. Um, the hygiene products are, are so useful. Um, and, and like Deacon Kim says, you know, we, we know that they're, they get in the right hands. Um, part of our mentoring program also is, is in, going to include an increase in um, release day preparation and pickup. So all of those things that the women can use when, when that day that they're released, um, soap, shampoo, um, you know, any of those kinds of things. Um, and, and at Magdalene House, we always need paper goods. I know that sounds crazy, but paper towels, toilet paper all the time. <laughs> so all the time, it doesn't stop. I still have two big Costco packs of toilet paper in my garage. Oh. I'll have to bring one to convention. I'll bring it to convention and give it to you just so oh, you can great. watch you parade through El Conquistador <laughs> with a huge pack of toilet paper on your back. <laughs> um, the other thing, too, with regard to clothing, I, I don't want to discount some of the wonderful organizations um, that are right here in Tucson and, of course, in the Phoenix area as well. There's O Pueblo Community Services that uh, could use clothing. There's the gospel mission right. that can use clothing. And we know that that clothing gets directly to the people that need it. So, um, you know, if you, if you have, if you have clothing that you, that you need to get rid of, you know, see me and, and we'll, we'll get you hooked up with a, a place to, to donate them. Um, and if you have women's clothing that you want to get rid of shoes and so on like that, um, you know, go through your closet. That's what I do. If I bring something new in, something old has to go out. Um, so I keep a sack there and fill it up. And when it's full, I give it to Deacon Gay. <laughs> so, do um, women, yeah, Debbie. Do the women know when they're going to be released ahead of time? Or does it come as a surprise? No, they they know. Um, but they they don't know. They don't know where they're going to go. And what I was wondering, if, if they have no one who's going to pick them up and there's no family, if, if you know the woman and you know her sizes, can't she be sent a package of shoes and, and clothing that is specifically boxed for her and it's there when she checks out that this is her package and it's got shoes and what she needs to get out the door? You, could, you can take them in the day before. So Sorry, some people juicy. can do that, you know, some people can do that, okay. take them in the day before so that it's there for them when they, when they get there, you know, when they wake up in the morning and they have new clothes, but um, no, you can't just send it through the mail. And the there might be contraband in it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Perryville is the only women's prison in Arizona. Yes. What about the private prisons? No women. No. No. Is it? Aren't there some that are co-ed? Some of the private prisons, Deacon Gay. Yeah, there may be. I, I, I honestly don't know. I, I remember I really a couple of our girls know. got. A couple of our girls got sent to a private prison uh, early they got, on. They got not. sent to Florence. But yes. then Florence closed. Yes. But that was because they were, they were overcrowded at Perryville. But but since COVID, the the numbers I'm sure you've seen, you know, have gone down. Nadine pretty significantly. Nadine. Um. So one of the things, like I when I was working, I was pretty involved with. Um, there was a women veterans program for women vets who are homeless and all of that. And I make jewelry and I donated jewelry to them. So I'm wondering if that may be something that would be helpful. Um, because when you go on an interview, you want to look good and you want to impress yeah. people. And I don't know how you can do that when you don't have anything. Right. Um, those kind of things are important. Ab um, absolutely would be would be wonderful to have because they love all of that. Yeah, that would be wonderful. The other thing that we're also working on is um, uh, 
getting them dental health and dental care so that because many of them don't have that and so we we actually just um uh worked out a deal with with three different dentists who will um help three different women so but we, and we haven't done that before so that's our first this will be our first you know go around with that so that'll be interesting to see excited about that yeah and, and, I, and I always else, it's I, amazing i always um i always laugh when i think about dental care inside prison oh. because dental care inside prison means whatever you think you might have wrong with your mouth every single tooth in your head will be pulled and you will be given dentures that's it that's the only option and so many of them don't want to do that don't and go. they'll suffer right. with um excruciating tooth pain until they get out and then they desperately need a dentist to try and fix years of uh neglect because they don't it's not like us where we get to go see a dentist once a year or twice a year or whatever no if you go to the dentist, he's going to pull your teeth. So they don't go. Um. <laughs> so, side note. Oh. Yeah, yeah, Holly. Real quick on that uh, note about dental care, uh, just, just in case it's ever handy, my father has actually gotten me some teeth stuff done in Mexico, like just across the border, and it's much cheaper. And they actually did an excellent job. So if, if anyone ever needs a referral, if, if they're desperate and can't, you know, yeah. Good there you know. go, Gay. Yeah, get yeah. that number. <laughs> Got that down. Got that yeah. down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can email it. I can find it for my dad and email it. Good. Yeah. Are there any other, other Please, questions? Re Reverend Gay, um, you said in the home, there's just enough room for six people. Yes. So, how do we how do you handle the overflow like so many more people at a time may need this kind of help what do you do for now well until right now i'm looking um for i'm actually um looking with the the um mayor and people from Avondale to um, look for a home that maybe needs to be um, repurposed or a piece of property that could be that we could build something on so that we can house more people. So I'm looking to expand additional units. If you have some funds, uh -huh. can you rent? Like there are a lot of a few homes around here and there that owners are looking to rent. Are you able to do that? We can rent if owners will rent to us. But there that was the problem that we had in the beginning is that they would not they did not want to rent to this particular population. And so we got turned down about 15 times. But Yes, if we like if I own my own home and chose to rent it out, I, I could do that or you could do that with a property that you have. So yes, that's possible. That's what if, I wanted if your to home, know. Yes. If your homeowners association will allow it, many of the homeowners associations will not allow anyone with a felony background to live uh, in, in that um, in that unit. So well that that is true but we if to run our home um the which is we're part of we are considered a recovery home so it's a protected class that's good so yes and i was wondering do you have to tell the home association what you're going to use your home for you have to you have you have to if you are applying for police something yes you have to tell them oh okay well there are some regular homes residential areas um depending on the zoning that you can't rent 
part of your house out. Uh, at least I know that's the way it was in Salt Lake City. They were clamping down on people who would just take part of their basement and do a little renovations and rent it out. And right. you can get stomped on by your city yeah. or zoning no. saying, hey, I, I'm, hey. Not interest, I'm not interested in doing that. I'm interested in a house yeah. or a, a multifamily complex. A duplex would be ideal. Mm -hmm. um, Tiny homes? Tiny homes? I've I've thought about that, but I I don't I don't know that it could work if there was the right property for it. Yeah. I think it could work. You might want one that would be a a, a larger building for meetings and so forth. Yeah, little tiny homes for each person. Yeah, and that that exactly could work. Yeah. And also, Reverend Reverend Gay, I. On Saturday services, I see you coming almost all the time with some good looking ladies. Are they these people from the house? Yes. Oh. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that, that that's one of the joys is that we get to come and worship together on Saturday. We have a great time. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, and, and it's important to um I know whenever I've had uh, uh, women that I knew from Perryville who who visited the churches that I, I was serving in up in um, Glendale and, and in the Churchfield Park and so on, um, that I always introduce them as my friend, um, protecting the privacy um, because it's up to them to determine if they want to share what they have gone through. and. And considering all of the punitive measures that they've in, endured for years inside um, those walls, they're a little scared about sharing their background with other people um, because they fear that they'll be labeled or, or um, you know, uh, perhaps worse um, by, by those that they thought they could trust. So we're always very careful when... Um, when we're around those who who have have come have come out of this environment to uh you know they're our friends they really yeah. you know they are our friends and that's how they're introduced and they're it's nobody's business um you know what where where they've spent the last 20 years or five years or six months it's it's up to them whether they want to share that. So um, you know, I just caution you that uh, if you do know someone or someone does come in and uh, you know they don't want to talk about the background, don't push them because they may have a very valid reason um, for that. And also to be uh, sensitive to people's desires to keep some some of their information uh, private. Yes, Kathy Krenz. Um, Deacon Kay, I was just wondering, kind of following that, is uh, um, counseling and therapy provided then as part of the two-year program for, for residents? All of those um, behavioral health services are outsourced and um, they are available to them. They have to go to at least one um, counseling uh, session. Many of them go to more than that, but, but some of them, it's, you know, they don't do it. They don't follow up. They'll do the mm -hmm. one. And as long as they get some sort of clearance saying that, that there's no serious um, mental illness, mm -hmm. then they won't go back to that. Mm -hmm which is a shame, <laughs> but. I just wanted to share, um, Marty uh, and my brother is a resident at um, Arizona State Hospital and I I applaud your program so much. I don't, uh, we're not aware of anything like this um, on the ash side of things. So just personally, I just hugely, hugely applaud you for your ministry and your program. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, and, and and Kathy, you know, my heart broke for you as you were trying to find a place for your brother to stay, and and there's mm -hmm. just there's just not enough places 
uh, there are halfway houses, but there aren't enough transition homes. Right. And, and exactly. pe people yeah. need something that's uh, that's going to be more than just a temporary shelter. They need a place that's going to help them transition into returning to society after years of incarceration. Um, you know, we've got people coming out that have never held a smartphone. Mm -hmm. um, so okay, this is, it, it's a huge um, uh, challenge to them mm -hmm. to uh, adapt quickly um, so that they can get a job, so that they can get a, a home, so they can get a car. All these things are all online. They're all smartphones. It's all language that is Greek to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's it's really imperative that we support any transition housing that we that we uh, know of. And, um, you know, I applaud Gay for, for getting Magdalene House going. I mean, that was just awesome. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, another house will fall into her lap. Uh, well, maybe yeah. not not quite into your lap, but another house will will uh, will come available. Come about. Yeah, because yeah, I just I got the the picture of the you know wicked witch being squished, and that's not what we want. I want that. <laughs> no, but maybe you know another house uh, house will God will provide as he as God provided for uh, for this particular one. Um, what about a house in Tucson? I mean, does, it seems like everything's up in Phoenix, but not some of these people maybe have contacts in other cities in, in Tucson, Arizona. Tucson would be great to have a to have another house. I I I feel like with this particular model, it's very important that it has um, it, it needs a community to back it. So if there were a church in Tucson that could support and operate a house, hallelujah, absolutely. And we would, we would work with them and, and help them get it going. They could even use our 501c3 if they needed to. So yeah, I mean, that would be, that would be great. It's just that I couldn't, I couldn't manage a transition home in, in Tucson. Right. Deacon Kim would have to take it over. We've got some. Deacon Kim's husband got some land. <laughs> She did another <laughs> ministry right now. <laughs> We've got that but, land sitting beside the church, you know. <laughs> there you yeah, go. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it would, it would never, hold a whole lot of tiny homes. You yep. never know where something might surface, right? You just, you never know. Yeah. How many women make it through the program? Do you have many that don't succeed and, and are unable to complete the program? You know, that is such a good question. And, and uh, uh, we had, we've had one graduate. We have another one coming up in, in November. And, and we've had many go through the program, but not stay the whole two years. And for a variety of reasons, but mostly it's because they go back to their families. So to, I can say to date that we have not had anyone return to prison that we've dealt with. So that we, we consider that a success. And that's know? in and two years or three years of? Well, our first resident was um, March of 2019. So I think it's yeah. three years. Three years. Which yeah. Is awesome. Yeah. So when you consider that we're that the recidivism rate nationwide, I mean, it's going to be a gamut, but it's between 40 and 60 percent. Um, so, yeah, it's money well spent. Yeah, absolutely. So any other questions for forget Jim Nelson, is that you waving at me? Or are you petting your dog? <laughs> it looks like he's trying to find his uh, unmute button. Oh. No, there he it's, is. It's, yeah, it's, it's not Jim, it's me, Deacon Kim. Oh, hi, Kathy. I just, hi. I just want to say I am involved with the Bridges Reentry Program as a mentor. And it is the most wonderful experience I have ever had in, in my life. It is absolutely very, very fulfilling. And anybody who wants to be kind and help someone come back 
into our society, I think if, if, that, if that's your calling, go for it because it's really, really a wonderful experience. Wonderful. Thank you, Kathy. We love having Kathy as a mentor. She's been fabulous, just fabulous. And they're in luck because the new fall classes for training mentors start this month. Yeah. So you've got your orientation where you, all questions will be answered on what, the 15th? The 15th, I believe. Yes. And the 17th. We have yeah. two different dates. Me so, I just and there, there's a, there, at our church in the parish hall, I've got flyers about the mentoring program and when the orientations are and when the training begins and how to how to you can go to the orientation with a no commitment required just to find right. out right you know what what it is and what's going on and and who can be a mentor and they don't have to be women mentors right for the females or do they have to be women i can't remember well i i think we're i i think yes right now women okay and they have to be over the age of 18 Okay, so I think we all qualify. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so anyway, um, you know, if you're interested in, in that program, there are flyers on the table in the parish hall. And Deacon Gay, don't you have an event coming up on the 18th of September you want to tell us about? Yes. Okay. So Holly 18th, might want to be sure and write this down, Holly. Holly, if you're if you're in the Phoenix area on the 18th from two to five. We're having an open house at Magdalene House, and so if you'd like to, if you'd like to see and what what it looks like, and kind of just get a feel for the operation, and to more importantly to meet some of the residents who are there, um, we welcome you. You can um, let's see how go to the website. Or you can put, your, if you're interested, you can put your email into the chat and we'll send you an evite in the next couple of days. But it'll be Sunday, September 18th. Yes, it 18th? September 18th. From two to five. And maybe Holly, you can share it with uh, AFN because I haven't been able to attend the last couple of meetings for the criminal justice group because um, of Oh, that would with be nice. my dad but maybe we could share it with the afn and and, and members could go um up there what yeah. else do you got yeah, going let me on? see if there's a uh way to share it with the group if la can send out something because we're not we're not actually having um our meeting in september so, oh but okay but, but that I'll was going to be spend. the one I was going to get to go to on the 20th yeah <laughs> no because we're doing uh, there are other events though so I'll try to I'll make a note to share it with Khalil and Ellie. Okay. Anything else exciting going on? Gay, you got any new ministries percolating around in that spiky hair? Yes. yes. Do you actually want to hear what it is? Yes. I'm thinking I'm going to share this because I'm thinking that um, there are many incarcerated women probably men too but i only deal with the women so the, there are many incarcerated who um will be impacted by the new um student loan forgiveness and i'm afraid that they're going to be left behind mm -hmm. and so i want to to figure out a way that um we can advocate for them and um maybe even just have somebody go to the prison and meet with them and help them fill out applications um, that need to be done. And maybe Holly, your group might be interested in, in working on that. I just, I, I was at a service the other night and 100% of the women there were impacted. So I think there's a lot more. So are they eligible? Um, I, I think if somebody went to school while they were in prison, they're not, I, I read something. I have to check. Um, well, the women I talked to had, they had 
loan, student loan debts before they were incarcerated. Okay. Then maybe and so yeah. what I want is what I want to see is that that they can apply for it while they're still incarcerated so that they don't have to wait until they get out. Yeah, no. They shouldn't wait because they're right. Yeah, I don't, right. Yeah, they, I don't know if there's a deadline on some of it. Um, there's also, I, I mean, I'm guessing a lot of them are potentially probably in default, which there are new special rules about default that are pretty beneficial too. Um, yeah. That's actually something I'm helping a family member with. So if I, as I get more information, I can try to, um, be a share that and maybe help that, that would be great that. i i just i don't know whether to go like to the to the education department or you know where mm -hmm. to what how to really attack great it. idea yeah that's a great idea um let me make a note to myself here um yeah it is a good idea i knew you would be thinking of something <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. There's always more, right? In prison, always in, more. In, in ministering to those affected by incarceration, wow. it's just like a bottomless pit of opportunity. <laughs> yeah. There's hey, so quick, many things. Quick question, and we can talk about this another after the you know another okay. day. But do, do you know? Like, I know there's a ton of money getting pumped into affordable housing into Tempe and Phoenix. Um, in the next few years, um, is my understanding, both for purchase and for rent. Do you do you have any idea yet, like what the restrictions might be on the for formerly incarcerated people? No, I I don't know. I'm okay. I'm I've I I'm trying to. Um, there's supposed to be stimulus money for housing, and. Um, so I'm on the list to be notified when they have information, but that's that's as far as I've gotten. Okay. Yeah, I would like to know more about what the cruel rules, current rules are, if they're the same for any of this new stuff. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how it works. So. Okay, thank you. And, and Nadine says that's also happening in the Tucson area. So that's something to probably stay on top of as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and Holly and Gay, if you guys don't have each other's email addresses, I can do a, a email. Uh, I can okay. do a virtual introduction. I think okay, I that do. Would be good. I have hers. I think yeah, I, I bet it's you not do. I'll message you. Yeah, if not, I'll message you. Okay. Okay. Um, we just have time for like one or two other questions. If anybody has anything um, that, you, that you'd like to say, you know, uh, uh, um, Deacon Gay is, is the reason why we have the robust prison ministry program that we have in the Diocese of Arizona. It's the largest um, uh, ministry program in our diocese program. It is. It's the largest. We have more things going on than anybody. Um, so, and, and a wide range. So, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty impactful. And it all started from her idea to take worship uh, services into the prison and everything else just grew organically um, from there to include our camp for the children of the incarcerated. Uh, you know, we got the art shows featuring the art from the women, which is on display at St. Matthew's right now. Um, and it'll be coming to the uh, Phoenix metropolitan area next year. Um, hey, good. So, you know, that it's it, it, all these programs all developed because um, God tapped Gay on the shoulder and she said, here I am. And she did it. And that's, that's really all it takes from, from any of us, uh, you know, is to, is to say, yeah, yeah, God, I'm here. What do you want? And boy, God will tell you. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't stop either. No, it doesn't. Nadine, did you have something? I did. Um, since uh, your talk on Sunday really got me thinking about um, the women who had all their art supplies taken away. Is there any way that we can, um, I know we can't get it to them in the prison, but is there a, any um, program that's like providing 
art supplies when they get out? You know, it's a really good question. None that I know of, but it's that so is a expensive. Really, yeah, that is a really good something to think about. So they still don't have their art supplies in prison anymore? Are they not, not allowed? Not anymore? the acrylic paints were uh, contrabanded, so they can't have those anymore. They're not selling the canvas boards that they paint on um, anymore because that was mainly associated with acrylic paints and they only sell the really cheapy watercolor paint brushes and the really cheap watercolor sets. Um, so it's getting more and more difficult for them to do art because, um, uh, you know, it's hard to get good, decent supplies. Is it that the um, prison won't buy them or the prison can't find the distributors that are cheap enough or, I mean, I know you can't send it to them directly, but if you had a good price on some good stuff from a company that would ship directly to the prison. They used to do that and they've stopped all that. Um, so, um, you know, that's, that's, it's just the way it goes inside the, they find something that people like and pretty soon that's gone. So I want to be respectful of, of Gay. She's going to have to, um, to, to leave in just a second. So if there aren't any other questions, is it, is it okay if I go on ahead and offer our closing prayer? Any other pressing questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for coming and spending the evening with us, Gay. Um, I think it was really helpful for everyone to kind of get an idea of what we're doing in the diocese, the Episcopal Diocese of Arizona, um, a little bit better idea of what some of the other programs that um, that you've started and uh, that we're doing, because I've talked about the ones that, that I've worked on. So they got a pretty good view now of, of, right. of what we've got going on. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so, so grateful for the opportunities that you send our way to love our neighbor. And we are especially grateful for the heart that you have given to those of us on, on this, uh, this, this Zoom meeting to, to help those who are oppressed, to those who are um, not given a fair deal honestly. And we're just so grateful that, um, that you have touched our hearts and that you have reached out to us um, to encourage us to do what we can to help our fellow human beings who are in need. And especially as we talk this evening, those who are affected by incarceration, whether that be families or uh, those who are, are affected directly uh, through being in, imprisoned or in jail. And we just pray that we can continue to respond to that small voice that you put in our heads that says, you can do this, or you could do that, or maybe you should look into this. And just pray, Lord, that you help us to continue to respond and, and obey. Uh, because we know um, from past experience that the surest way to happy life and, and inner peace and joy is to hear and obey and act. And so we're so grateful, Lord, for the opportunities you've sent our way and keep them coming. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Deacon Gay for being with us this evening. Appreciate that. Thank you all for, for being here this evening. I'm hoping that next Thursday, we will have someone from Death Penalty Alternatives of Arizona to talk to us. But if it's not next Thursday, it'll be the Thursday after because <laughs> they're trying to decide which Thursday they can do it. Um, and then the end of the month, I have an attorney that's going to speak with us about restorative justice. Very cool stuff. So we'll have three guest speakers um, in September is my hope. And uh, then a couple of, uh, of other options. Debbie's trying to work something out. I know Kathy Cranes is some, trying to work something out for us too. And they're just waiting on me to tell them what days are available <laughs> to see if they're available for those days. So be some exciting stuff coming up and, and uh, I hope to have you join us again 
uh, next Thursday for some more interesting conversation. So have a blessed evening. And we'll see most of you in church. Vicki, thank you for joining us. We appreciate having you here. And you're welcome to join us for any of these. Same link to anyone that you want to come to. So any anyone is welcome. So have a blessed evening, a safe weekend, and we'll see some of you in church. <laughs> Bye now. <laughs>